Um, Andrew, great to meet you in person, of course. Great to meet you in person, person too. So I'm here with the legendary, the legendary Dr. Andrew Lampinen from DeepMind. Andrew, how are you finding the conference? Having a great time so far. It's been amazing to see everybody in person again and lots of exciting stuff going on. Awesome. So, um, you know, what is top of mind for you and what, what have you been looking at recently? Um, I've been really excited about language in many different contexts. So language and reinforcement learning and language models, their capabilities and reasoning and so on. And so I've been excited to see tons of stuff that's happening here in all of those domains, honestly. Fantastic. So um, give, give me some examples. What have you been looking at? Yeah, well, there's this this great, um, one of the outstanding papers was Srijan Kumar's work on using language or programs specified in sort of like language-like inputs to shape the inductive biases of reinforcement learning agents. I thought that was really cool work. It's kind of related to some of the things I've been, been interested in lately. Um, I thought that, actually, I found um, Juho Kim's keynote really inspiring in speaking about sort of like Think about the full interaction system, like how AI would interact with humans in a product. But I think that the the broader idea that I really like there is thinking about, you know, the full AI interaction system, period. So like when we're thinking about the failures of, let's say, a language model system in a certain kind of reasoning, we often don't think about the full scope of how that system would be deployed or how it would be used in practice. And I think that in some sense, this is actually a reason that comparisons between the capabilities of humans and the capabilities of language models are a bit skewed because humans are a full system that's doing many kinds of things. Language models are a very particular component and the way that you would use it in practice, you might get more robust performance by incorporating it into a larger system. So on, on the language models, you know, um, there's been a lot of discussion around this um, reinforcement learning human feedback, which I think is quite interesting. I, I think it kind of brittleizes the model, you know, from a robustness point of view, but it makes it more likely for us to anthropomorphize it and think it's doing magical things. So, you know, um, talk to me about the possibilities of large language model. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm very interested in some more analysis of the full extent of what things like RL from human feedback do to these models, because I don't... I don't think we really understand everything there. I mean, one paper I've been really interested in recently is Laura Ruiz had a paper. I don't think it's here. I think it was just put on archive on, uh, it was called something like large language models are not zero shot communicators. And she was looking at these sort of kind of pragmatic inferences that humans make that we're very good at and showing that language models don't do them so well. Zero shot, few shot prompting helps a bit, but actually the instruction tuned or maybe the RL from human feedback models are a lot better. And one mm. story you could tell is that there's something about that interactive context, sort of like getting those interactions with humans that is teaching you a bit of something about pragmatics itself. And so I thought that work was really stimulating and interesting from that perspective. And I'm excited to see more investigations. Along Fantastic. Along. And um, but what are your thoughts at the moment about the, uh, the grounding problem with, this, uh, with respect to large language models? Well, uh, yeah, that's a great question. It's something I want to think a lot more about. I mean, I'm, I tend to think that it's possible in principle to learn through language alone anything that can be tested through language alone. But that's a very different question from saying that, you know, you can then just easily apply a language model to some sort of grounded context. And I think that some of the successes and failures people have seen of applying language models to things like, you know, language models as part of a, a image discussion system, like in our Flamingo model, or as part of an RL system, you know, you do see some breakdowns. I think it's because we haven't figured out the right way, kind of as I was mentioning with Juho Kim's talk, we haven't figured the right way to put these models into a full system in a way that makes them robust. I think part of it is that we haven't figured the right way to really tie them down into the grounding yet. So there's, there's definitely interesting work to be done. I've been speaking to a lot of people that have been talking about, um, you know, reality plus augmenting humans with language models, what happens in tandem with, with AI and, and humans. Um, do you think that might, you know, like, I'm skeptical. I think language models don't have agency, intentionality, creativity, lots of magical things that we have. Um, what do you think might happen when, when we enmesh the two together? Yeah, I absolutely think that's a valuable direction. I mean, you know, there, there's lots of systems that don't have agency or the things we have, like even, you know, a, a programming language like Python or Mathematica or something. They're the nevertheless very powerful tools when you put them in the hands of humans who do have intentions and agency and so on. We can use them to do things that we can't do on our own. And so I think that to some extent, language models can serve that purpose. Um, I'm not sure that's the limit of what they can do, but it's certainly one thing they can do. But again, you have to think about how the full system plays together and the weaknesses that these models do have 
have. You know, they're not always factually grounded. So you may want to do something like, you know, tune the model in various ways, get it to refer to sources so that the humans can actually check on what it's reporting to them and so on. But they are powerful compendiums of knowledge, at least in principle, and they can perhaps enable us to do things more effectively and more efficiently than we could before. Amazing. I'm, I'm interested to know where you think agency starts, because um, if, if you're cynical like me and you say, well, the computers only do what we tell them to do, then you kind of, I mean, you know, Searle actually traces back the argument to you need biology to have agency and, and, and so on. So, but, but an, another less cynical argument, if you're, you know, like a computationist and you think it's all information, would be something along the lines of, well, the language model, it's, it's a little bit like the, the bit of sand in a pearl, right? And, and it kind of like you get the pearl from the bit of sand. So those are the starting conditions. But where do you think agency comes from? I'm not sure if I know the answer to this. I think it goes back to some of the deep philosophical issues around things like free will, right? Is there, is there really much, that much difference between a language model that perhaps is doing everything we tell it to or a computational system that's doing everything we tell it to and us if we are actually just sort of like deterministically following the evolution of the wave function of the universe or whatever, you, however you want to think about it. And there, there's a fairly big debate about the extent to which we do have free will. And I, I'd be interested to ask you how that impacts your thinking about the agency that we do or don't have. Maybe you think, you know, biology and quantum mechanics somehow come together to resolve it. Um, I honestly don't know. Uh, and there are, there are so many different ways of, of, of looking at it. Yeah, so you, you, can, you can use the, the Penrose argument, as you just said, or, 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 or Searle's argument, um, or you can just think that it, that it just naturally um, emerges from, from information. But um, okay, th this is really interesting. So um, what else is top of mind for you at the moment? Um, I, yeah, so I'm very interested in these grounding problems, actually, quite generally, because I'm, I'm interested in applying, you know, language to reinforcement learning. And I've done a lot of work in sort of language models and a lot of work in language plus reinforcement learning, but not that much work tying them together. I'm interested in that. And that requires really tackling this grounding problem seriously. Um, but I'm... Just before, just to hold that thought, could you sketch out an example? So um, applying language to a reinforcement learning agent, what would a good example of that be? Yeah, so there's been a, a few papers that have done things along these lines. Uh, there's kind of a wide scope of things you could do. I mean, there, there's things like um, Helm that basically use a language, pre-trained language model as just some sort of inductive bias for initializing your your um, your RL agent, and it's you're not really using that language in any particular way. There's systems more like React, let's say, that do some sort of more language-like planning and try to use that to control an agent, or SACAM does something like with sort of an earlier version of that. Um, and I think that there's, you know, a wider range of things that could be explored. Some of my colleagues, Ishida Dasgupta and co are presenting a paper at a workshop today on using sort of language systems in a somewhat SACAM like way, but where the system actually sort of gets the agent to, uh, get, gather information from the environment and provide that, report that back to the language model to help it to reason through the correct solution to the problem. And so I think there's kind of a wide range of things that you could possibly explore in this space. And part of the question is, well, which, which of these are actually effective? And you know, do you need to fine tune the language model in order to do that? Or do you want to freeze it so you preserve its knowledge? Or do you want to you know, train some sort of do like parameter efficient fine tuning? There's, like a, there's a huge space of things you could consider there. Awesome. So um, this, this grounding thing, it, it comes back to the very simple notion of syntax versus uh, semantics. And uh, Searle, of course, spoke about that. Um, what's the general, I mean, are, are, are you a rare breed or are loads of people in the community thinking about this as a serious problem? I think that, I think that there's perhaps a little less worry about that in the community. I mean, I, I think there's, you know, lots of people are thinking about it hard, but I think language models have shifted the narrative on this a little bit because First of all, we see that they're capable of learning quite sophisticated syntactic structures from language alone. And of course, they do that from a lot more data than humans get. So it doesn't, it's not like that alone refutes Chomsky's arguments about poverty of the stimulus or anything. But it is suggesting that, well, maybe the kind of separation of syntax and semantics that you have in Chomsky style linguistics, at least, is not a necessary feature of the system at the scales that we're training them now. And of course, I mean, if you're, depending on your perspective, you might think that these models have absolutely no semantics because they're just observing words and maybe semantics is something beyond language entirely. So um, yeah, depending on your perspective, you might see these models as actually a separation of syntax and semantics.
Very interesting. Now, um, you wrote that beautiful paper and you were invoking, you know, Pierce's triad and, and also speaking about Wittgenstein and, and so on. And, and, you know, again, this is what Searle called, um, the, the matter of, um, epistemic, um, subjectivity and observer relative, uh, concepts and, and so on. So, um, that to me, that, that kind of, um, relativistic worldview is, is almost anathema to the, to the modus operandi in the community. So, um, how much traction are you getting with that view? I don't know. I guess we'll have to see in five or 10 years where the community is. I mean, I think these things always sort of evolve over time. My sense is that people are much more open to the possibility that language models, say, have some kinds of knowledge that would be useful for solving problems in practice. And I'm not sure they're, I guess this is kind of what I mean. I'm not sure they're so concerned about the philosophical discussions about like, well, do they have any meaning or don't they, for instance, or is it all relative meaning? Can they, can they know the true meaning of anything if the system is effective in practice? And so my intuition, although I'm certainly not sure of this, is that we will see an increasing shift towards just deploying language models as part of a larger system to do some, some task, and it will be improved both by scaling of language models, possibly things like you know, multimodal training of them that may improve some of these grounding issues, possibly things like interactive training, RL from human feed feedback, or more sophisticated methods that may improve some of these issues. But I think people will perhaps stop worrying about this to the extent that they see the systems just being increasingly effective in the world. That, that would be my prediction. So I've been so impressed with language models. When they first came out, I agreed with Bender that they were stochastic parrots. I agreed with Marcus that they were bloviators. And now I'm, I'm, I'm halfway on the continuum, right? They're doing really, really amazing things. And you just tell them what to do in natural language. They do what you want to do. And then we get to this notion of, well, well, are they behaving intelligently? And we can use the lens of behavior. And, you know, you get this receding horizon of mimicry. And when the mimicry reaches a threshold, we kind of think, okay, this thing is the real deal. And Melanie Mitchell said, oh, maybe it's another mode of understanding. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, in some sense... Yes. So I, I agree with that sentiment, at least that it's, you know, a, as things recede into, oh, well, language models actually could do that. We do start to, you know, rethink things a bit. And eventually at some point it just feels like, well, maybe, <laughs> maybe this is just another mode of understanding. I do. I also agree that it's a different mode of understanding. Like I certainly don't think we understand the world through language alone. Um, that would be kind of a radical Fodor style language of thought way to think about things. But I, I think that our understanding is much more embodied and grounded. And so that I, I think that our understanding of all the concepts we talk about in language is probably vastly different than the understanding that these systems have. But I guess the, the question is the extent to which it's different in a meaningful way that impacts the capacities of the system. Like, is the difference in my understanding of some concept uh, something that you can assess by talking to me in language alone? And is it meaningfully different from a language models in a way that impacts my ability to reason about that concept better than that model or not? Um, and I think that's that's the key question, and I don't think we fully know the answer now, but like you, I've been impressed with how far these models could get from text along. Fascinating. Now, um, linguists still, uh, still um, cite Fodor and Polition, you know, the, um, the connectionism critique, and they spoke about productivity and systematicity. I'm not sure whether you studied that, but you've got a cognitive science background, so you're, you're probably au fait with that. And I just wondered how relevant, I mean, you know, I think Gary Marcus's compositionality argument is kind of in, in that line of thought. How relevant do you think that argumentation is today? My perspective on this, which we mentioned a bit in our symbolic behavior page that you mentioned earlier, is that humans are certainly not perfectly systematic compositional generalizers, and that can be seen in a wide variety of cases in terms of the sort of recursive grammar structures that I looked at in a recent paper, or in terms of our logical reasoning, or in terms of even, you know, people who do sort of like classic you know, composition experiments with simple toy grammars in the lab, like Brendan Lake, people are pretty good at generalizing these grammars in some sense, but, you know, they're getting something like 
80% compositional generalization, which if you showed that to Gary Marcus and told him it was from a neural network, he would probably say, oh, that's just obviously the system doesn't have real compositionality. So I think there's, I think there's an issue here, which is kind of subtle, which is that I, I know I wrote about this in a recent paper, which is that Chomsky introduced this idea of the competence performance distinction which is the idea that the competence a system has, that is the underlying true capability, is different from you know, the performance it might exhibit in practice. So I think to some extent, everybody intuitively agrees with this. Like even if you know how to answer a question, like a math question, let's say, you might in practice make some mistakes, you perform differently than your competence would allow you to in principle because you're distracted or you're sleepy or you, know, you just do some math wrong in your head or whatever. And so, but I think that that distinction leads to very unfalsifiable claims. And in particular, it leads people to make claims from like people exhibiting 80 or 90% compositional generalization that, oh, people really have a compositional competence. And the rest of this, you know, the 10, 20% errors is just noise. It's just, you know, mistakes of performance. It's not something deeply meaningful. But people analyzing neural networks take that claim that humans have a compositional competence at face value. And so if they see the network not exhibiting perfect performance, they say, oh, it's doing something different than humans. And so they're not giving the benefit of the doubt, the competence performance distinction to the model in the same way that they are to humans. And I think that this makes the comparisons between humans and models very challenging. Just not even to set aside all the, the stuff that I mentioned earlier, the Juho Kim style stuff about, you know, the model as part of a larger system and humans being competent, more exhibiting better performance, perhaps because of the other systems we have intervening. That was a really good answer. You, you mentioned Chomsky. We spoke to Chomsky recently. And as you know, he's, he's got a bit of a, a bad take on deep learning. Um, he says it's not a contribution for science. He likes bulldozers too. They're good for clearing the snow. But, uh, you know, he, he thinks that we've, we've given up on trying to understand many things in science, partially because it's beyond our cognitive um, horizon. Um, what would you say to Chomsky? I would say, I mean, I, I think it's useful for people to have different perspectives. And, you know, Chomsky has certainly inspired a lot of the linguistic field to think about things the way he has. And I think a lot of the field, as you mentioned earlier, are continuing to not see deep learning as the fundamental answer to understanding these things. So I'm not, I'm not too concerned that we will give up on seeking other kinds of understanding. But I'm also optimistic that the successes of deep learning in learning things like language can give us new hypotheses about where the human language capability might come from. And indeed, people have been investigating things like whether you can get a language model to learn, you know, human language-like representations from a more reasonable amount of data, kind of more like what humans get. Um, and I think it can afford us new ways of investigating what the structure of language knowledge looks like by looking at the representations and computations of these models and potentially arrive at a more deep understanding of what language actually is in the human system. So I'm, I definitely think it's good for people to be working on different perspectives on this, but I'm really excited about this era, this new era of language research. And I hope that eventually the rest of the linguistic field will come around to that as well. Amazing. And in that vein, what's the most important research question that you're going to try and answer this year, the coming year? Oh, boy. Uh, I'm not sure yet. I'm, I'm planning to take some time after this conference to brainstorm and think about what the most important things to work on next are. This issue about grounding is very uh, high in my mind. So that, that may be one of the fundamental questions I want to to tackle and you know what what would be learned differently from a model that was learning in a more embodied setting like humans are and what things might be learned much more efficiently if if it's even possible to learn them from language alone what might be learned much more efficiently for an embodied agent so those kind of questions are very interesting to me oh and you just triggered me with the e-word which is wonderful um <laughs> I'm, I'm just um i mean obviously I, i'm an outsider to cognitive science but the the four e's have been a really interesting development over the last couple of decades and my friend mark bishop said it was um you know his only place to hide if if he if you don't like computationalism but i just wondered uh, is, is is that your school of thought in the four e's i see myself as floating a bit between different schools of thought, I guess. I, I definitely find certain things about the embodied or even inactivist perspectives interesting. And I think they're very 
useful ways to think about things. I, I don't like being too committed to computationalism or representationalism in particular. And I really like this old paper from Paul Sisak called uh, Beyond the Computer Metaphor, Behavior is Interaction. I find that quite inspiring. So I don't, I'm not committed to one of these perspectives. I think perhaps they're all a little bit too extreme, but I think that it's useful to think about all the different ways that we could imagine that the brain is approaching the problem of being a human doing things in the world and perhaps by training agents to solve these tasks and then seeing what sorts of solutions they're arriving at we can come to a hypothesis about what it is that the brain is doing and how it is solving that problem amazing dr andrew lampman thank you so much for joining us today thank you so much for talking to me